The Complete Visions of and Catherine Emmerich The valley through which Jesus went by night from Kislev Thabor is called Edrin, and the shepherd village in whose synagogue the Pharisees of Nazareth had so derided him was named Chimki. The people with whom Jesus and the five disciples put up outside of Nazareth were Essenians and friends of the Holy Family. The Essenians, both men and women, dwelt around here in the ruins of old stone vaults, solitary and unmarried. The former wore long white garments, the latter mantles, and both cultivated little gardens. They had once dwelt near Herod's castle in the valley of Zabulon, but out of friendship for the Holy Family had come hither. He with whom Jesus stayed was named Eliud. He was a very venerable, gray-haired old man with a long beard. He was a widower, and his daughter took care of him. He was the son of a brother of Zacharias. The Essenians lived very retired around here, attended the synagogue at Nazareth, and were very devoted to the Holy Family. The care of Mary's house during her absence had been entrusted to them. Next morning the five disciples of Jesus went into Nazareth to visit their relatives and acquaintances, also the school. Jesus, however, stayed with Eliud, with whom he prayed and very confidentially conversed, for to that simple-hearted, pious man many mysteries had been revealed. There were four women in Mary's house besides herself, her niece, Mary Cleophas, Johanna Chusa, a cousin of Anna the prophetess, the relative of Simeon, Mary, mother of John Mark, and the widow Leah. Veronica was no longer there, nor was Peter's wife, whom I had lately seen at the place where the publicans lived. The Blessed Virgin and Mary Cleophas came to Jesus in the morning. Jesus stretched out his hand to his mother, his manner to her being affectionate, though very earnest and grave. Mary was anxious about him. She begged him not to go to Nazareth, for the feeling against him there was very bitter. The Pharisees belonging to Nazareth, who had heard him in the synagogue of Chimki, had again roused indignation against him. Jesus replied to his mother's entreaties that he would await where he was the multitude that were to go with him to the baptism of John, and then pass through Nazareth. Jesus conversed much with his mother on this day, for she came to him two or three times. He told her that he would go up to Jerusalem three times for the Pasch, but that the last time would be one of great affliction for her. He revealed to her many other mysteries, but I have forgotten them. Mary Cleophas was a handsome, distinguished-looking woman. She spoke with Jesus that morning of her five sons, and entreated him to take them into his own service. One was a clerk, or a kind of magistrate, named Simon. Two were fishermen, James the Less than Jude Thaddeus, and these three were the sons of her first marriage. Alpheus, her first husband, was a widower with one son when she married him. This stepson was named Matthew. She wept bitterly when she spoke of him, for he was a publican. Jose's Barsabas, who also was at the fishery, was her son by her second husband Sabas, and by her third marriage with the fisherman Jonas she had another son, the young Simeon still a boy. Jesus consoled her, promising that all her sons would one day follow him. Of Matthew, whom he had already seen when on his way to Sidon, he spoke words of comfort, foretelling that he would one day be one of his best disciples. The Blessed Virgin returned from Nazareth with some of her female relatives to her abode near Capernaum. Servants had come with asses from the latter place to conduct them home. They took several pieces of furniture with them which, after their last journey, had been left behind in Nazareth, various kinds of tapestry and woven stuffs, packages of other things, and some vessels. All were packed in chests formed of broad strips of inner or outer bark, and fastened to the sides of the asses. Mary's house in Nazareth was so ornamented that it had, during her absence, the appearance of a chapel. The fireplace looked like an altar. A chest was placed over it on which stood a flower pot with a plant growing in it. After Mary's departure this time, the Essenians occupied the house. Jesus passed the whole day in most confidential intercourse with Eliud, who asked him various questions about his mission. Jesus explained all to the old man, telling him that he was the Messiah, speaking of the lineage of his human genealogy and the mystery of the Ark of the Covenant. 
I learned then that that mystery had, before the flood, been taken into the Ark of No, that it had descended from generation to generation, disappearing from time to time, but again coming to light. Jesus said that Mary at her birth had become the Ark of the Covenant of the Mystery. Then El who, during the discourse frequently produced various roles of writing and pointed out different passages of the prophets, which Jesus explained to him, asked why he, Jesus, had not come sooner upon earth. Jesus answered that he could have been born only of a woman who had been conceived in the same way that, were it not for the fall, all mankind would have been conceived, and that, since the first parents, no married couple had been so pure both in themselves and in their ancestors as En and Joachim. Then Jesus unfolded the past generations to Eliud, and pointed out to him the obstacles that had delayed redemption. I learned from this conference many details concerning the Ark of the Covenant. Whenever it was in any danger, or whenever there was fear of its falling into enemies' hands, the mystery was removed by the priests. Yet still was it, the Ark, so holy that its profaners were punished and forced to restore it. I saw that the family to whom Moses entrusted the special guardianship of the Ark existed until Herod's time. At the Babylonian captivity, Jeremiah hid the Ark and other sacred things on Mount Sinai. They were never afterward found, but the mystery had been removed. A second ark was, at a later period, constructed on the first model, but it did not contain the sacred objects that had been preserved in the first. Aaron's rod, also a portion of the mystery, were in the keeping of the Essenians on Horeb. The sacrament of the blessing was, however, but I know not by what priest, again replaced in the Arkansas. In the pit, which was afterward the pool of Bethsaida, the sacred fire had been preserved. I saw in pictures very many things, which Jesus explained to Eliud, and I heard part of the words, but I cannot recall all. He related the fact of his having taken flesh of the blessed germ of which God had deprived Adam before his fall. That blessed germ, by means of which all Israel should have become worthy of him, had descended through many generations. He explained how his corning had been so often retarded, how some of the chosen vessels had become unworthy. I saw all this as a reality. I saw all the ancestors of Jesus, and how the ancient patriarchs at their death gave over the blessing sacramentally to the firstborn. I saw that the morsel and the drink out of the holy cup, which Abraham had received from the angel along with the promise of a son, Isaac, were a symbol of the most holy sacrament of the new covenant and that their invigorating power was due to the flesh and blood of the future Messiah. I saw the ancestors of Jesus receiving this sacrament in order to contribute to the incarnation of God, and I saw that Jesus, of the flesh and blood received from his forefathers, instituted a most august sacrament for the uniting of man with God. Jesus spoke much to Eliud also of the sanctity of En and Joachim, and of the supernatural conception of Mary under the Golden Gate. He told him that not by Joseph had he been conceived, but from Mary according to the flesh, that she had been conceived, of that pure blessing which had been taken from Adam before the fall, which through Abraham had descended until it was possessed by Joseph in Egypt, after whose death it had been deposited in the Ark of the Covenant, and thence withdrawn to be handed over to Joachim Menen. Jesus said that to free man he had been sent in the weakness of humanity that he received and felt everything like a man, that, like the serpent of Moses in the desert, he would one day be raised up on Mount Calvary where the body of the first man lay buried. He referred also to the sad future that awaited him and to the ingratitude of man. Eliud simply and confidently asked question after question. Although he understood all that Jesus said better than did the apostles, although looking upon things in a more spiritual sense than they, Yet all was not clear to him. He could not rightly comprehend how the mission of Jesus was to be accomplished. He asked Jesus where his kingdom was to be, in Jerusalem, in Jericho, or in Engadi. Jesus answered that where he himself was, there would his kingdom be, and that he would have no external kingdom. The old man spoke to Jesus so naturally and simply. He related to him many things of his mother, as if he knew them not and Jesus listened to him so kindly. He told him of Joachim Menen, and spoke of the life and death of the latter. 
Jesus remarked that no woman had ever been more chaste than in, that she had married twice after Jochum's death in accordance with the command of God, for it was proper that the number of fruits destined to be produced by this branch should be filled up. As Eliud recounted the circumstances of Anna's death, I had a vision of the same. I saw her lying on a rather high couch in a back room, something like Mary's, of her own large house. She was unusually animated and talkative, and not at all like a dying person. I saw her blessing her little daughters, also her other relatives, who were in the antechamber. Mary was standing at the head, Jesus at the foot of her bed. Jesus was, at this time, a young man, his beard just beginning to appear. And blessed Mary, begged the blessing of Jesus, and continued speaking in a joyous strain. Suddenly she glanced upward, became white as snow, and I saw drops like pearls starting out on her forehead. I cried out, Ah, she is dying! She is dying! And in my eagerness, I wanted to clasp her in my arms. Then it seemed to me that she came and rested in them. On awaking I still thought that I held her. Eliud related also many things connected with the virtues of Mary in the temple. As he spoke, I saw it all in vision. I saw that her teacher Noemi was one of Lazarus' relatives. She was about fifty years old and, like all the other women who served in the temple, she was an Essenian. I saw that Mary learned from her how to knit. Even as a child, she used to go with Noemi when the latter went to cleanse the different vessels and utensils that had been soiled with the blood of sacrifice. Certain parts of the animal sacrificed were received by them, then cut up and prepared as food for the priests and others who served in the temple, for they depended in part upon that for support. I saw the Blessed Virgin at a later period helping in these duties. I saw Zachary, when it was his turn to serve in the sanctuary, visiting the child Mary. Simeon also knew her. And so, as Eliud was recounting it to the Lord, I saw all her pious and lowly serving in the temple. They spoke, also, of Christ's conception, and Eliud told of Mary's visit to Elizabeth. Eliud mentioned also a spring that Mary had found there, and that too, I saw. I saw the Blessed Virgin going with Elizabeth, Zachary, and Joseph from Zachary's house to another little property belonging to him, and on which there was no water. The Blessed Virgin went alone into the garden, a little rod in her hand, and prayed. She pierced the earth with the rod, and a tiny stream gushed out and flowed around a little knoll. When Zachary and Joseph removed the earth with a spade, an abundant supply rushed forth, and soon formed a most beautiful spring. Zachary dwelt about five hours southward from Jerusalem, and a little to the west. In confidential discourse like the above, interrupted only by prayer, Elu treated with Jesus. He honored him, but quite simply and joyously, looking upon him as a chosen human being. Elu's daughter did not dwell in the same house with her father, but at some distance in a rocky cavern. There were about twenty Essenians living on the mountain. The women dwelt apart from the men, about five or six together. All honored Eliud as their superior and daily assembled around him for prayer. Jesus ate with him alone, but very sparingly, their repast consisting of bread, fruit, honey, and fish. Weaving and agriculture formed the chief occupation of these people. The mountain at whose base the Essenians dwelt was the highest peak of a ridge on one of whose plateaus Nazareth was built. A valley lay between it and the city. On the other side the descent was steep and overgrown with verdure and grapevines. The abyss at its base, the one into which the Pharisees at a later period wanted to precipitate Jesus, was full of all kinds of rubbish, verdure, and bones. Mary's house stood on a hill outside the city, part of it extending into the hill like a cave. The top of the house, however, arose above the hill, on the opposite side of which lay other dwellings. Mary and the other women accompanied by Kaliah, Lee's son, arrived at her house in the valley of Capernaum. Her female friends in the neighborhood came out to meet her. Mary's dwelling at Capernaum belonged to a man named Levi, who lived in a large house not very far from it. It had been rented from Levi by Peter's family and given over to the Holy Family, 
for Peter and Andrew knew the Holy Family in a general way, also through John the Baptist, whose disciples they were. The house had several buildings attached to it in which relatives of the family and the disciples could stay when visiting the Holy Family. It appeared to have been chosen on that account. Mary Cleophas had with her her little boy Simeon, about two years old, the son of her third marriage. Toward evening Jesus accompanied Eliud from his house to Nazareth. Outside the city walls, where Joseph had had his carpenter shop, lived several people, poor but good, who had been known to Joseph, and among whose sons were some of the playmates of Jesus' childhood. Eliud took Jesus to visit these people. They offered their guests a morsel of bread and a little fresh water. The water was especially good in Nazareth. I saw Jesus sitting on the ground among them and exhorting them to go to the baptism of John. They acted somewhat shyly in Jesus' regard. They had in the past looked upon him as one of themselves. But now that he was so gravely introduced to them by Eliud, whom they all so highly honored, whose advice they often asked, from whom they were accustomed to seek consolation, and who, moreover, united in persuading them to go to the baptism, they could scarcely reconcile themselves to the position he now held toward them. They had indeed heard of the Messiah, but they could hardly think that Jesus was he. The next day Jesus went with Eliud southward from Nazareth through the valley of Esdralon on the road to Jerusalem. When about two hours beyond the brook Kison, they arrived at a village consisting of a synagogue, an inn, and only a few houses. It was one of the environs of the not far distant Ender, and nearby was a celebrated spring. Jesus put up at the inn. The people of the place behaved rather coldly, though not inimically toward him. Eliud was not held in special esteem by them, for they were rather pharisaical. Jesus notified their headmen that he intended to teach in the synagogue, but they replied that that was not usual for strangers. Jesus told them that he had a special call to do so and, entering the school, he taught of the Messiah whose kingdom was not of this world, whose coming would not be attended by outward splendor, also of John's baptism. The priests of the synagogue were not favorably inclined toward Jesus. Jesus bade them give him the scriptures. He unrolled them and explained many passages from the prophets. Eliud's confident communications with Jesus were to me singularly touching. He knew of and believed in his mission and supernatural advent, still without appearing to have a suspicion that he was God himself. He told Jesus quite naturally, as they walked together, many things connected with his youth, what the prophetess Anna had related to him, also what she had heard from Mary after the return from Egypt, for Mary had sometimes visited her in Jerusalem. Jesus, in turn, related to Eliud some things that he did not know, each accompanied with significant interpretation. But all was so natural, so simple, like a dear old man speaking with a beloved young friend. While Eliud was rehearsing what Anna had heard from Mary and told to him, I saw all in pictures. I rejoiced to find them exactly similar to what I had long before seen and partly forgotten. Jesus spoke to Eliud also of his journey to the baptism. He had gathered together many people and sent them to the desert near Afra. But he said that he would go alone by the road past Bethania, where he wanted to speak with Lazarus. He spoke of Lazarus by another general name, which I have forgotten. He mentioned also his father, saying that he had been in war. He said that Lazarus and his sisters were rich, and that they would devote all they had to the advancement of redemption. Lazarus had three sisters, the eldest Martha, the youngest Mary Magdalene, and one between them also called Mary. This last lived altogether secluded, her silence causing her to be looked upon as a simpleton. She went by no other name than Silent Mary. Jesus, speaking to Eliud of this family, said, Martha is good and pious. She will, with her brother, follow me. Of Mary the Silent, he said, she is possessed of great mind and understanding, but for the good of her soul, they have been withdrawn from her. She is not for this world, therefore is she now altogether secluded from it. But she has never committed sin. If I should speak to her, she would perfectly comprehend the greatest mysteries. She will not live much longer. After her death, 
Lazarus and his sister Martha will follow me and devote all that they possess to the use of the community. The youngest sister Mary has strayed from the right path, but she will return and rise to higher sanctity than Martha. Eliud spoke also of John the Baptist, but he had not yet seen him and was not yet baptized. Jesus and Eliud spent the night at the inn near the synagogue, and early on the following morning, they journeyed along Mount Hermon toward the somewhat dilapidated city of Ender. Around the inns lay masses of broken walls all the way along the mountain so broad that a wagon could pass over them. Ender was full of ruins interspersed with gardens. On one side were large, magnificent buildings like palaces, while in other quarters of the city the desolation of war was visible. It seemed to me that the inhabitants were a race apart from the Jews. There was no synagogue in Ender, so Jesus went with Elu to a large square in which three side buildings containing small chambers were built around a pond. The pond was in the center of a green lawn, and on its waters little barks were sailing. There was a pump nearby, and the place bore the appearance of a health-giving resort. The little chambers around the pond were occupied by invalids. Jesus, accompanied by Eliud, entered one of the buildings. He was hospitably received, and his feet washed. A high seat was erected for him on the lawn, and there he taught the people. The women who occupied one of the wings took back seats in the audience. These people were not Orthodox Jews. They were more like slaves, cast out and oppressed, who had to pay tribute of all that they earned. After a certain war, they remained behind in the city. I think their leader, Sisera, was defeated not far off, and was then murdered by a woman. Point one, his army had been scattered throughout the whole country and reduced to servitude. There were still about four hundred in these parts. Their forefathers had, under David and Solomon, been forced to quarry stones for the building of the temple. They were long accustomed to such work. The deceased king Herod had employed them in building an aqueduct to Mount Shaun of several hours in length. They were very compassionate and stood by one another under all circumstances. They wore long coats and girdles. Their pointed caps covered their ears like those of the ancient hermits. They had no communication with the Jews, although they were allowed to send their children to the Jewish schools. But the poor little creatures were so badly treated and so despised that the parents preferred keeping them home. Jesus felt great compassion for them. He had the sick brought to him. They sat in a kind of bed like my reclining chair, I can still see them, under the movable back of which were supports. When the back was let down, the chair formed a bed. As Jesus instructed them about the Messiah and baptism and exhorted them to the latter, they answered timidly that they could not lay claim to such a privilege, for that they were only poor outcasts. Then he taught them by the parable of the unjust steward. The clear interpretation he gave of it, I perfectly understood. It haunted me the whole day, but now I have forgotten it. Perhaps I shall recall it again. Jesus also related the parable of the son sent by his father to take possession of his vineyard. He always related that when instructing the poor, neglected heathens. The people prepared a repast for Jesus out in the open air. He invited to it the poor and the sick, and he and Eliud served them at table. This action greatly impressed his entertainers. That evening Jesus returned with Eliud to the place outside of Nazareth, where he stayed overnight and celebrated the Sabbath in the synagogue. The following day, Jesus and Eliud returned to Ender, which was only a Sabbath distance from the inn, and there he taught. The inhabitants were Canaanites, and I think from Sikhem, for I heard that day, at least once, the name Sikhemite. They had an idol hidden away in a subterranean cavern. By some kind of mechanism on springs, it could be made to rise suddenly out of the earth and seat itself on an altar beautifully ornamented and prepared to receive it. They had procured this idol from Egypt, and it was named Estart, which I understood yesterday to be the same as Esther. The idol had a face round like the moon. On its outstretched arms it held something long and swathed, like the chrysalis of a butterfly, large in the middle and tapering at either end. It may have been a fish. On the back of the idol was a pedestal upon which stood a high pail, or a small half-tub, which extended over the head. 
and it was something like ears and green husks, also fruits and green leaves. The idol stood in a cast that reached up to the lower part of the body, and all around it were pots of growing plants. These people worshipped their idol in secret, and Jesus in his instructions to them reprehended them for it. They had been accustomed to sacrifice deformed children to the goddess. There was a companion idol belonging to this goddess, the god Adonis, who I think was Astarte's husband. This nation, as has been said, had been defeated in three parts under their general Sisera, and scat tiered as slaves throughout the country. They were at this time greatly oppressed and despised. Not very long before Christ, they had excited some disturbance around Herod's castle in Galilee, after which they were still more oppressed. In the afternoon, Jesus and Eliud returned to the synagogue, and there ended the Sabbath. The Jews, meanwhile, were very much displeased at Jesus' visit to Ender, but he reprehended them very severely for their hard-heartedness toward their abandoned fellow beings. He exhorted them to a spirit of kindness and urged them to take them to the baptism, which they themselves had, at his recommendation, resolved to receive. The Jews of this place became more favorably inclined toward Jesus after they had heard his instructions. Toward evening he returned to Nazareth with Eliud, I saw them conversing together the whole way, sometimes even pausing to stand and talk. Eliud was again recalling many of the incidents of the flight into Egypt, and I saw them again in vision. He began by asking whether Jesus was not going to extend his kingdom over the good people in Egypt who had been impressed by his presence among them in his childhood. Here I saw again that the journey of Jesus after the raising of Lazarus through pagan Asia down to Egypt and which I had seen before, was no dream of mine, for Jesus told Eliud that wherever the seed had been sown, would he before his end reap the harvest. Eliud knew of the sacrifice of bread and wine, also of Melchizedek, but he knew not what idea to form of Jesus. He questioned him as to whether he was not another Melchizedek. Jesus answered, No. Melchizedek had to pave the way for my sacrifice but I shall be the sacrifice itself. I learned also from that conversation that Noemi, Mary's teacher in the temple, was the aunt of Lazarus, his mother's sister. Lazarus' father was the son of a Syrian king who had, for services in war, received some property as a reward. His wife was a Jewess of distinction. She belonged to the priestly race of Aaron, although Manasseh's allied with Anna and dwelt in Jerusalem. They owned three castles, one in Bethania, one near Herodium, and one at Magdalum, on the Sea of Galilee, not far from Tiberias and Gabera. Herod also had a castle in the country near Magdalum. Jesus and Eliud spoke also of the scandal Magdalene gave her family. Jesus went home with Eliud. There they found assembled the five disciples, the Essenians, and many others who were desirous of going to the baptism. Some publicans, also, had come to Nazareth for the same purpose, and several bands had already started for the place of baptism. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now, and at the hour of death. Amen.